Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to the Saltire Society event tonight. We've had a really busy day today. Um, this is the third performance of the day um, with our guest, James Robertson. Now, I'm just going to say something uh, quick by way of introduction, because I know you're dying to hear from the man himself. But I do think that we have to uh, acknowledge uh, who our speaker is tonight. Um, Edwin Morgan, uh, in the um, Catstone magazine for Corey and Sanux, uh, is quoted in the summons, the year was ending and the land lay still. Now, I have to blame John Bruce in part for my knowledge of James Robertson because he said to me there's this amazing book and the land lay still and I'm not going to wax lyrical about it because I know that John has things to say about it but I have to say that this book um, transformed everything I thought about holding passionate beliefs about things, about expressing things without having arguments. It taught me so much about the history of the time that it's mentioned in. And it also taught me so much about the author. And what I want to tell you about the author, James Robertson, is that he has written five novels, uh, six, actually, sorry, to be continued, ironically, is the sixth one. He is co-director of a children's publishing firm, Ichiku, and he also was long-listed for the Booker Prize in 2006. James has a long association with the Saltar Society. In 2003, Joseph Knight, his second novel, accorded him the winner of the Saltire Society Scottish Book of the Year. And again in 2010, with And the Land Lay Still, the Saltire Society awarded him again Scottish Book of the Year. And he now is an honorary member of the Saltire Society. He is a much valued friend. It has taken me, I tell you, we have persevered, James and I, with conversations that ranged over four years before we finally found a date when I could get him to come over to Aaron. So despite the weather, I'm really glad he's here. He was absolutely amazing with the children. You could have heard a pin drop as the secondary ones and secondary twos got granted their request for a reading of the Gruffalo, which James has translated into Scots. But what I would like to say is that we are deeply honoured that you've come to be amongst us tonight, James. We're so looking forward to everything that you have to say. And without much ado, ladies and gentlemen, I give you James Robertson. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Hazel, and uh, thank you all for coming out. I wouldn't have come out on a night like this for me, I tell you, but uh, but you're here now, so I've got you. Um, so, um, yeah, it's it's great um, to be here. It's um, 15 years, I think, since I was last in Aaron, so it's been, been far too long. But inevitably, um, Scotland being the small place it is, um, I've just uh, reconnected with somebody that I haven't seen for... 25 years or thereabouts, Tim Pomeroy, who's at the back there, who uh, I last saw in uh, Clydesdale when I was, uh, he was working as a sculptor there and I was writer in residence at, at Brownsbank Cottage, the former home of Hugh McDermott. And it's kind of interesting just to pick up on what uh, uh, Hazel was saying just there about how things change you or change your life change your life, change your way of thinking, um, because that's what McDermott did to me when I was in uh, was 20 years old, um, and uh, and McDermott died, and I didn't know anything about him, I don't think I'd even heard of his name, or if I had, I knew nothing about Hugh McDermott, I didn't know anything about his poetry, but something 
in the obituaries or in the, the news of that made me start to read him and uh, it totally transformed everything I had previously known or thought about language, literature, Scotland, politics, you name it. It just uh, it was like a revolution in my head. And, um, and it, so it was really strange and wonderful that um, about 15 years later I should end up uh, living in McDermott's cottage and sleeping in his bed uh, for two years. He obviously wasn't there by that stage. But that again was a transformational two years. That was the period that enabled me to leave um, full-time employment. I was a bookseller at the time and and become or concentrate fully on being a writer. So uh, I, although I never met McDermott, I owe him a, a huge debt uh, because without first his, his influence when I was a, a, a much younger person and then secondly without that opportunity of, of, uh, of living and working at Brown's Bank, uh, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. So that's a, a sort of an interesting place to start the idea that we're all really part of something of passing things on from one person to another, one artist to another, one writer to another. Uh, yeah, well, I'll start off by saying that um, there's another Scottish writer called Alan Massey, um, who is now, Alan's probably in his early 80s now, I think, who I know quite well, and he and I have got um, quite a lot of respect for each other's work. We occupy very different political points of view, but, um, but I like him, and, and he's an interesting man, and he's a good writer. And he said something a few years ago which I thought, I'll just store that one away, and, and, and I thanked him privately for it. He was writing a, a, an essay, and he said something to the effect of, um, very often novelists don't know what it is they've written until some time after they've finished writing it. In fact, sometimes not until long after they've published it. And I thought that was a very true thing to say because my experience of writing is that I very often have no idea what it is I'm writing or trying to say until sometime after I've said it and written it. For me, the purpose of writing something, whether it's a short story or a poem or a novel, is to find out, in, a, in, a, in the sort of most basic of senses, to find out what happens. Um, so I don't know usually when I start writing a, a novel where it's going to end up. I might have a vague idea, but the interesting thing for me is the, the, the route by which I get from the starting point to the finishing point. Uh, and that's a, it's, a, it's a way of writing which is fraught with risk and, uh, and usually means that it takes me three times as long to write anything as, as I should do because I keep making mistakes and going down blind alleys and having to come back again. Um, but it seems to me that that's, it's an interesting way to write because um, things come out the other end that you didn't necessarily expect. So having said that, I'm now going to read you a little short story. This is from a book called 365, which came out uh, five years ago. And what I did six years ago in 2013, on the 1st of January, I, I woke up and um, I turned to my wife and said, um, I think I might try and write a short story every day this year. And she kind of looked at me as if I was insane. And um, anyway, I spent January writing a short story every day. And then I handed them over to her and said, what do you think? And she said, ah, some of these are all right. Um, so that was, my <laughs> that was my cue for continuing with the process. But to make it manageable, I, and it, because obviously a short story can take a long time to write, I, I, I decided that I would limit the, um, the, the word count to exactly 365 words for every story which was an interesting kind of discipline to, to put around the idea of writing a story. So by the end of the year, I had 365, 365 word stories. And then the following year, we put them out on the internet one a day and people could sign up to have them delivered into their emails. And, uh, and then the book came out later on that year. So I'm going to start with one of these stories, which, and this one is from the 2nd of January and it's just called Story. What is a story? 
A writer friend tells me that if he said he went on a train from Perth to Doncaster, changing at Edinburgh, that wouldn't be a story. But if he said it was only when he got to Doncaster that he realised he'd left his bag in Edinburgh, that would be. Something has to change for it to be a story, my friend the writer said. Something has to happen. A boy goes out to the shop and doesn't come back. A boy goes out to the shop and doesn't come back for seven years. A boy goes out to the shop and when he comes back seven years later, he is a girl. These are stories, if I am not mistaken. Here is another. A boy goes out to the shop for a pint of milk, but coming home, he turns left instead of right and walks through the woods. In the woods, he finds a strange mound covered in thick, soft, green moss, and he sits down on it, and he falls asleep. And while he sleeps, out from a door in the side of the mound come the fairies, who drag him away to their underground world. They beat him and starve him and make him their slave and put a spell on him so he forgets who he is. After seven years' hard labour, they let him go and he wakes on the soft green mound with a confused memory of that terrible time. And the pint of milk is there on the ground beside him. So he hurries home and in through the door, and in tears he tells his mother and father what happened. How sad and worried they must have been all the years he's been away. They smile at him. That's a good story, they say, but you've only been gone 20 minutes. And he sees that they are no older than they were when he left. And he looks in the mirror, and neither is he. But when his mother opens the milk, it is shrunken and solid like cheese. And according to the stamp on the carton, seven years out of date. So one of the things about going off to other worlds is that you always have to come back with something to demonstrate you've been away. Somebody just handed this little pebble to me earlier on, fortuitously. You know, you go off to fairyland or you're taken off somewhere and when you come back, nobody believes you've been there, but you've got proof that you've been there. In this case, the, the, the proof in that story doesn't actually match up. There's a, there's a, there's a, you can de deconstruct that story as often as you like and it doesn't work because the, the seven-year-old milk um, does not tie in with the fact that the boy does not appear to have aged and his parents he's only been away for 20 minutes. And I quite like those kind of stories where things are not resolved. Uh, some people get really infuriated by them. Uh, in my novel, The Testament of Gideon Mack, which I'll talk about in a wee minute, um, uh, the, the, the main character is a minister of the Church of Scotland who falls into a, a, a raging river and is apparently rescued by someone who he thinks is the devil. And I've had people coming up to me and saying, I've read to the end of that book and then I read it again. And um, uh, tell me, does he really meet the devil? And I say, well, what do you think? And they say, well, I don't know. You tell me, you wrote the book. And I said, well, I don't know. Uh, and they get really annoyed with me because they think I should. But they're sort of missing the point, really, about that book and about a lot of these things, which is that um, we don't necessarily know the, the answer. And the answer to things is not always in black and white. Let me try to flesh out to that idea a wee bit. Um, Hazel mentioned that I've published six novels. I have quite a few others that have not been published and I don't think ever will be. I started writing when I was very young. Uh, I started writing really as soon as I could physically write. I just wanted to tell stories and if, before I could actually write properly, I just drew stories. My uh, father came home one day from his office um, with a um, great big old um, Underwood typewriter, you know those things they were like, they were about that size, and the office was chucking it out, and he brought it home for us, <coughs> my brother and sister and me, to, to play with, as it were. But it still worked. 
And to me, this is a revelation because I could then, with one finger, stab out uh, a story and the, the stuff appeared on the paper and it looked like what books look like. And I knew at that point that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to create, to, to write books. So I started writing the only thing that I was interested in at the time, which was um, the Wild West. So I, I wrote Westerns, never having obviously been anywhere near America. And, um, and, uh, and I wrote a couple of Westerns and I wrote a couple of other stories in my teens. And, and they're hidden away somewhere and will either be burned or something between now and... Uh, and eternity, but um, then I then I I went off and did loads of other things. I went to to university and I studied history, and this opened up the idea of the relationship between the past and the present and the future, which is something that I think recurs in all the stuff that I do. I'm fascinated by the passage of time, and I'm fascinated by what it does to individuals and also to the societies in which they live. Uh, an undergraduate, then I went off and did various things and I came back and, and I did a, ended up doing a PhD on the work of Walter Scott, still in the history department. Um, and I'd, I'm still fascinated by Scott as somebody who has presented Scottish history to us in a certain way and we're still living through the, the, the kind of consequences of the way that Scott portrayed history. And I don't mean that in a negative way. Uh, I think he was an astonishing writer, an extraordinary writer, but he was so influential that we are still living with the echoes of the way that he presented our past to us. Um, I've just actually produced a little essay about this, this which um, came out as a pamphlet last week, and I've got a few copies, which I'm happy to give away at the end of the talk if anybody's interested. Um, so I studied history and then I went back to the idea that I really wanted to write fiction. So it was inevitable in a way that the first novels that I started to write as a sort of adult were, were really rooted in the idea of how, how does the past relate to the present. And not only does how, the, how does the past affect the present, but also how does the present affect the past? Because I don't really believe that... We all kind of think, well, the past is over and it's static. But of course it's not. The past changes every time we go back and look at it because we have new perspectives and we have new information about it. And so the past is just as fluid in a way as the present and the future. And this was something that I tried to deal with in my very first novel, first published novel, The Fanatic. Um, which was really set in, uh, in Edinburgh in the late 1990s and really concerns a man who um, gets a part playing a ghost on one of these ghost tours of Edinburgh um, and he, uh, he becomes really involved and, and, and interested in finding out more about the character of the person he's playing, the ghost he's playing, who was actually a real person from 300 years earlier. So the novel became uh, 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 two stories, one set in the 1670s and 80s, one set in the 1990s, so 300 years apart, but basically all happening uh, about 300 yards apart in the old town of Edinburgh. And I explored this interrelationship between the, those two time zones quite thoroughly in that book, partly because I thought, I'll, this is probably my one shot of getting the book published and I'll never have a chance, so I've chucked everything I possibly could into this one novel. And I was very lucky and eventually I got a publisher who published it and it did quite well. So I realised that I was actually going to have another shot at, uh, at looking at this idea. But it's the thing that I keep coming back to is, is, is the, the way that time affects us all and, and affects the way we tell our own stories as well. As we age, um, we, we keep revising the stories of our own lives. Um, and I think that's what we do as, a, as societies and communities and nations as well. We keep looking back and changing, changing the story partly to suit um, the way we're looking at it. And if we're honest, sometimes we also look at the past and realize that it's not telling us everything that we should know about it. Which kind of leads me on to the second novel I wrote, which is called Joseph Knight. Um, 
which is an entirely historical novel. And the reason that that came about was because um, after I'd written the first novel, a friend came up to me and handed me a, a sheet of paper, a sort of photocopied sheet of paper, which was from a history book of Dundee, and said, um, here's, your, uh, here's an idea for your next novel. And all it was was a, a paragraph that said that um, in Dundee in the 1770s, a man who had been a slave and owned by a Scottish master won his freedom and married a Dundee girl. And um, his name was Joseph Knight. And that was all it said, really, but I thought that's quite intriguing, particularly as I had studied 18th century Scottish history and um, I had never come across this story before at all. Um, and I began to look into it and gradually began to uncover uh, not only the story about Joseph Knight, who indeed was a, a slave a, taken from Africa as a boy of about 10 years old over to Jamaica, sold into slavery, and then um, brought by his Scottish master back to Scotland about 10, 12 years later. I'd never heard of this at all, but neither had I at that point fully understood the very, very close relationship that Scotland had had with slavery in that whole period of the 18th and early 19th century. I'd always thought that slavery was to do with London and Liverpool and Bristol, the slave trade and so on. And that Scotland, if it had a role in it at all, was really about David Livingstone, um, you know, uh, campaigning against slavery in Africa in the mid uh, to late 19th century. And suddenly, when I researched this novel, I realized that that was not the case and that, like most other or many other European countries, we had also been up to our eyeballs in, in the slave trade, but also specifically in running plantations in the British colonies in North America and in the Caribbean. Jamaica was known as the Scottish island in the late 18th century because so much of it was owned by uh, Scottish planters and so many of the people who were working there uh, came out from Scotland and you may remember that Robert Burns was on the point of going to Jamaica um, when his uh, first book of poems, uh, the Kilmarnock edition, was published to great success and he was able to abandon that plan and uh, stay in Scotland. Uh, and he wasn't the only one, lots and lots of people went out to uh, run the plantations and effectively to be slave drivers. So the story of Joseph Knight was a revelation to me and totally opened up a, a world uh, of, 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 uh, of the past that I just had not known existed. I thought I was sort of a lone person sort of shooting in the dark at this point, but a lot of historians were working on this at the same time. And now we are, that, that book was published in 2003, so we're now 16 years further on from that. But in the last 20 years, we have learned so much more about that, uh, that role and that relationship uh, between the Caribbean and Scotland and, between, and, and learned about the amount of money that, was, that, that came back um, from the plantations um, and which really, to some extent, helped to kickstart the Industrial Revolution in this country. So. Um, it was a total revelation to me and, and the, the more surprising because I had thought I knew about that period of history. It's funny how sometimes we think that the past is fixed and done and over and, and it never is. We keep thinking the thing that, that there are no more stories to be told about, for example, the First World War and then more stories emerge and the Second World War is the same. Uh, it, the past is, is, I think it's William Faulkner says somewhere, the past is is, is never over, it's not even past. And I think it's very true, it still informs us, but we inform the past in the same way. Mm. On that basis, why well, don't I read you another story? This is definitely a story about my past. When I was writing these stories, I had to come up with a new idea every day, so it was quite challenging, and sometimes at 10 to midnight, I'd be scratching my head going, I've got 10 minutes to write this thing. But I did manage to do one a day, uh, virtually all the time, except about the middle of the year, my father, who's no longer alive, um, was, was um, very unwell and, and everything stopped for about a 
five days um, while we went off to try and sort them out. And, um, and then I had to write two a day for about three weeks just to catch up, which was, which was a bit um, of a nightmare. Anyway, one of the themes of the year was thinking about my father getting older and becoming more and more infirm. And this is one of those stories. And it, as I said, it's really a sort of reflection back to, to a past that I can barely remember. It's called My Father Swimming. Once I was lost at the seaside. My parents searched for me in a state of panic. It was high tide and I was three. They searched along the promenade and behind the row of beach huts and with churning stomachs they scanned the grey sea that was level with the top of the steps leading down to the beach, looking, I suppose, for some small floating thing that might be me. But I was dry and safe. I'd just gone for a wander and was happily being entertained by some other family to whom I had attached myself. It was my parents who were lost and distraught and were not found again until the moment they saw me. I don't remember this incident, but I do remember other things about those seaside holidays. My father used to go for long swims when the tide was lower and I was playing on the sand along with the other children. I could see his head as he did the side stroke or the back stroke. He was a slow, steady, powerful swimmer. How much he must have enjoyed the solitude and peace out there, away from the demands of family. There was a pier about a mile along the coast, and sometimes he would strike out for it, and I would lose sight of his head as he swam further away. I don't think I was worried. I knew he'd come back. I can still see him in the water. I imagine him reaching the pier, swimming round its barnacled and weed-wrapped legs and heading back to us, always at the same calm, methodical stroke and pace. I wonder if he imagines that swim or even remembers it. Today he needs someone to help him into the shower, to wash his back while he grips the safety handles, to dry him off with a towel and get him dressed. It's a long distance from now to then, much more than a mile there and a mile back. I wonder if, when he's in the shower, he ever closes his eyes and for a moment is back in that sea, strong, alone and free and swimming away from everything. And I'll just read another one just now. Um, similar sort of thing, I think, um, uh, but from a different time. Um, this is back in 1970, it was either 76 or 77. There were two very, very, very hot summers. 76 was really hot and 77 was pretty good as well. And I can't remember which year it was, but um, it was one of those anyway. And I had a job, I'd just left school and I had, had a job um, over that summer um, working at the safari park at Bled Drummond, which wasn't far from where I lived. And, um, and uh, this, this is what happened. Um, it's called Bath. I suppose it's connected in a weird kind of way to that last story. That was the year Stevie dug a mud bath for the elephant. The hot days started in early May, and I remember there not being any rain until August, although that's possibly a false memory. The elephant was in his enclosure and getting frustrated with the heat bouncing off the concrete all round him. And this wasn't Africa, it wasn't even the south of England, it was Scotland. We took turns at playing a hose on him, but his skin dried out in a few minutes after, a few minutes after you stopped and these cracks were appearing, sore-looking, like the cracks of a dried-out riverbed. So Stevie spent four days digging a pit in the monkey section, a 200-yard run from where the elephant was kept. We had to get clearance from the big man because, theoretically, it was dangerous letting the elephant loose. There were cars coming through that he could have charged or just decided to sit on. 
But the big man said, on you go. So we went. The day came when we opened the gate and took him down the road to the monkey section. Stevie running ahead and me coming behind in the Land Rover with the lights on so the elephant wouldn't think twice about stopping. Stevie led him to the mud bath and that elephant went in like a diving submarine, covering himself in the cooling, healing mud and trumpeting with pleasure. We fitted the hose to a nearby standpipe and kept the bath topped up. And I'll tell you, I've seen a lot of things, but I've never seen an animal so obviously deliriously happy. Later that day, we ran him back to the enclosure and he went without a fuss. And the next day, we took him to the bath again and every day for the rest of that summer till the weather broke. He used to sprint down there like a child on a beach heading for the sea. It was a crime, really, keeping such a beast in captivity. But Stevie made life better for him that summer, at least. He was a good man, Stevie. You only had to see what he did for the elephant to know that. Gideon Mack, I mentioned very briefly, I was obsessed with the idea of uh, writing a book about a man who didn't believe in God or in anything supernatural, but then weird supernatural things began to happen to him. And um, originally this was going to be a school teacher um, that this stuff happened to. But I had started writing this book and then I got sidetracked by the Joseph Knight story, so um, I put it away for two or three years. And when I came back, I thought it would be much more interesting to make this atheist uh, minister in the Church of Scotland. Um, actually, I discovered later there's loads of atheists and ministers in the Church of Scotland, so it wasn't that unusual, but I didn't know that at the time. I don't know if any of you have read um, James Hogg's wonderful novel, Confessions of a Justified Sinner, but again, I, I, it's a novel that I've been obsessed with for a long time, and I, and I wanted to kind of revisit that idea, uh, but to put it into reverse, Hogg was writing in a very, a very um, devout, um, period of time writing about somebody who goes off the rails with their particular brand of religion. I was interested in writing a story set in our present times, which in, certainly in this society has become a very secular society, but I was interested in exploring what religious belief, organized religion, um, faith of any kind still means or can mean to us uh, in this day and age when, when secularism has kind of um, become the norm, as it were. I also thought that I was going to write about the social changes that have taken place in Scotland over my lifetime. I was interested, for example, in thinking about Sundays, Scottish Sundays, if, you know, we're all, most of us anyway, of an age when we can remember what they were like, um, when you couldn't do anything, there were no shops open, uh, and so on, and, you know, I remember my father and my mother saying, well, you can go out in the garden, but don't make any noise. Um, uh, I wasn't really supposed to even take my bicycle out on the street, on the road, uh, and it wasn't so much that we were desperately religious, but they didn't want to offend anybody else, and they didn't want to upset the norm. And I'm sure this was commonplace. And all that stuff about chaining up the swings, well, that happened in the village that, that we lived in. You know, you couldn't go and play on the swings at, on a Sunday because they, they were chained up. And then we went from that to now, where Sundays are, not only are they just like any other day of the week, but then more like any other day of the week than any other day of the week. You know, people go to the shops and they go to football and they go to everything else. And I was interested in exploring that because it seems to me that while on the whole I totally am in favour of a more secular society, you also lose something. You lose things as well as gain things. And I was interested in that whole aspect of it. So I thought I was going to be writing much more about those big global changes that have happened in society. But in fact, it ended up being a novel about one man and his particular problems and his particular psychological problems. That's the book that um, was um, long listed for the Booker Prize. And it's also the book that probably, well, it certainly has been to date my, the best-selling book I've ever published because it got picked 
um, for something called the Richard and Judy Book Club. I don't know if you remember this. Um, my, my, my agent phoned up uh, one day and said, uh, we think that, that they're going to pick your novel t as one of, the, one of the big reads for the, the Richard and Judy Book Club. Uh, do you have any objections? And I sort of went, I don't know, who, who are Richard and Judy? <laughs> so I didn't know anything about this. Was, it was ridiculous. But, um, but at that point, I'm talking about 13 years ago, Richard and Judy's book club was massive. It was on Channel 4, I think. And the book sales from the books that were selected on their, uh, by them on their, their televised book club accounted for something like 15% of all book sales in the UK. It was just a phenomenon. It's much, much less. I think they still do it, but it's much, much reduced now. So, of course, my publishers and my agents were very keen for, this, for me not to object. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. Um, but it was kind of interesting because I think that, that uh, a novel about a Church of Scotland minister falling into a, water, a river and then possibly meeting the devil in an underground cave, I really didn't think that was going to do very much. But as a result of being on that it got exposure, exposure that probably made it sell ten times more than, I would have, than anybody would have expected. So um, thank you Richard and Judy for that. Um, it was it was it was quite a phenomenal thing actually. However, it didn't really answer the question that I had really wanted to answer, which was, what has happened to Scotland over the last fifty years? And so, having got that book out of the way, I then went to start writing the the book that Hazel already mentioned, and the landlady still. This is a novel that I had always thought I would want to try to write. I was quite politically, I was very politically active in the 1980s and the 1990s. Um, um, I, I didn't like the 1980s at all, politically. And, um, and I was quite involved in um, uh, the sort of campaign for a, a Scottish, well, assembly as it started off, and then Scottish Parliament as it later became. And I remember thinking in the sort of late 80s, early 90s, that one day, if if we were successful and we did achieve a Scottish Parliament, it would be interesting to, to try and tell that story through fiction. So um, around about the year 2006, I thought, I'm ready to try and tell that story now. But what I found very quickly was that I couldn't, tell that story by just looking at the period I'd been involved in in the 1980s and 90s. I was going to have to go back much earlier than that in order to try and explain the arc of the story that I wanted to tell. And the arc of the story was, how did Scotland go from after the Second World War to the early part of the 20, 21st century and appear, from my perspective, to go from being a society in a country that was absolutely firmly tied into the whole notion of Britishness to being a country that had not only a ch got a, a parliament but was also um, really beginning to toy with the idea of, of more power possibly of independence. And what I wanted to, to write about was the three things that I think changed that made that possible. Uh, or made that, that journey possible. The, the three things really were that the Second World War um, was a very unifying um, series of events um, because everybody within the United Kingdom basically was united against fascism and, and that whole um, war effort was, was a, a very unifying effort. And that was one of the reasons why I think in the immediate aftermath of the war, Scotland was very, very closely tied into remaining and being part of the UK. And the idea in, in the, that period that uh, if, you, if you were even bold enough to suggest that you were in favour of Scottish independence, you were kind of treated as a, as a lunatic. Um, and even in the 60s, I remember people just laughed the idea off. It was just ridiculous. Um, the second thing was that, that immediately after the war, the British Empire was still very much in place. It was beginning to be dismantled and, and countries starting off with India and then a little bit later Ghana and then a whole lot of other countries would gradually uh, stop being colonies and, and become independent countries. But the notion of, in, of the empire 
was absolutely embedded into the consciousness of, of people right across the British Isles and further afield and, and had been embedded for a century or more. And the third thing was that after the war, another big factor in keeping everybody tied into the idea of, of, of Britishness was the creation of the welfare state. That was the, that was the reward, if you like, for the, for the, uh, the, the, the sacrifices that people had made in, in the war period and in the 1930s as well, which had been a, a really awful time for so many people. And um, these things, I think, meant that 1950s Scotland uh, was absolutely t embedded and tied into, into the British state. And what I was interested in was to find out or investigate what had happened to change that. Um, and one can look at the dismantling of the empire, one can look at the, 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 the distancing of, of memory from the war, and then you can look at the dismantling of the welfare state that began to happen in the, actually probably in the 70s and then with increasing vigour in the 80s and 90s. That's only part of the story, but it's an important part. But the other side of things I wanted to, talk, to, to investigate was all the stuff that happened at the same time, the way that society changed, and it's changed, and it changed all over the world at this period, particularly in Western Europe and America and Australia and so on, but, but everywhere. Um, but there were particular characteristics in Scotland that were slightly different. But you know, generally, there was a revolution in sexual terms. There was a de revolution in women's uh, position in society. There was a revolution in the way that people went to work. You know, the great days of thousands and thousands of people going to work in, in factories and so on was beginning to come to an end. Um, uh, and there were a whole load of other things going on. The decline of, of the influence and power of religion and the rise of mass media and so on. And I wanted to explore all that and see if there was a particular Scottish story um, that, uh, that applied there. So I'm going to read you a passage from this book. It's a, bit, it's a huge book. It's about 670 pages long. And when I sent it in to my agent, finally, a year late, um, uh, she phoned up and said, well, I've just received it, but I thought you were only writing one book and you've written three. So we thought about trying to divvy it up into, into a trilogy, but it just wasn't going to work the way that I'd constructed it. So, and also at that point, it was 100 pages longer than it, than it ended up being, so I did take quite a lot out. I wanted to read you a passage as a kind of description, as a sort of aerial photograph, if you like, of Scotland in the autumn of 1950. And I wasn't alive then, so I kind of had to recreate it by talking to people and doing lots and lots of research. It starts off with the aftermath of a mining accident, which is actually based on a, on a real event which happened in Ayrshire um, in uh, September 1950 at a place called Nokshunach. Um Some of you will probably know where that is. And uh, there was, a, there was a, a, real, a real terrible disaster. I think about 120 miners were trapped underground for several days, and several of them were killed. But they got most of them out but it was a massive operation, and they got them out one by one um, by, built, by tunneling into another shaft, a disused shaft, and then they had to get um, uh, aqua breathing equipment down there and train these guys how to use it and bring them out one by one. Uh, it, took a, it took about 36 hours to get them all out. I re reconstructed this, this accident in uh, an imagined town uh, on the other side of the country in the sort of, well, mythical sort of Clackmannanshire, East Stirlingshire kind of area. And the town that I called this was Borland's Logie. But fundamentally, it's based on that event in Nokshinach. And it's the same time, it's September 1950. And some of the, the little quotes here actually come from um, testimony from, from the Nokshinach event. Um, so it starts off with that, and then it goes into a kind of, as I say, a photographic picture or portrayal of, of the rest of the country. They brought the last of the men up in the early hours of Sunday morning. All those lives surfacing one after another. Hundreds more gathered at the pit head like a crowd in some medieval painting of the Day of Judgment, cheering and weeping and prayers offered silently into the night. And the ones who had not come back, the seven left to haunt the bowels of the earth, remembered and mourned. Journalists making notes in shorthand, queuing at phone boxes, 
heading back to Glasgow, Dundee, London, through the wireless, a kindly, eager Oxbridge voice asking rescued miners about their experience. What did it look like, this stuff that was coming towards you? Oh, it was like porridge, thin porridge, a sort of brown colour. That's when we were at the top of the return airway outlet. And, and was that where you were trying to get out? Aye, but we couldn't, so we, we made doing the hill again to the main hall. And there it was, black, dirty sludge, 12 feet high, just slush, moss. Uh, and later, while you were waiting to be rescued, how did you spend your time? Well, there were a few songs and a, a hymn for one of the young lads, and we all joined in on that, the old rugged cross. Uh, and to keep the spirits up, there was one or two dances. Dances? Oh, I, I bet you were glad when you first saw the rescuers coming through to you. Oh, it was like seeing angels coming to meet you then, when you seen the lights of the brigade coming. We knew then there was a great hope. And were any of your own people waiting for you at the pit head? Oh, hi. In mining towns like this, everybody's their own people. Everybody's alike. We're all Jock Tamson's bairns. Yes, I've heard that said often. It's true. There was one there, a brother of mine. He flung his arms round my neck. And I don't mind telling you, the big tear was in my eyes. The big tear was in his eyes. This was Scotland in 1950. Coast to coast, Jock Tamson's bairns stood or sat, lugs cocked to the wireless for news from home and abroad, from Borland's Logie, from Korea, or tuned in for the McFlannels on a Saturday night, or it's all yours on a Monday with young Jimmy Logan doing the daft laddie Sammy Dreep spluttering sausages as the boys. This was Scotland in 1950, land of 250 pits and 80,000 colliers, 100,000 farm workers and four universities, land of Singer sewing machines in Clyde Bank, the Saxon Shoe Company in Kilmarnock, Cox Brothers Jute Mills in Dundee and the North British Locomotive Company in Springburn, every town and city and every part of every city with its own industries and hard-won skills, land of textiles and paper, hydraulic pumps and valves, carpets and linoleum, and 28 shipyards employing 60,000 workers on the Clyde. This was the land recovering from war, the land of nationalisation and council house building, its old, grease-thick, reeking, clanging, heavy industries re-injected with life and a grim, tired kind of hope, the grinding last surge of steel and shipbuilding before Japan and Germany got up off their knees. This was the land that had change coming to it, like it or not. The closure of factories and the shedding of skills, the land of ten-pound emigrants dreaming of fresh starts and sunshine in Australia, of letters written to cousins in Toronto and Auckland and Durban giving dates of expected arrival, of new investment from NCR, Honeywell, IBM, Hoover, Goodyear. This was the land of Leyland Tiger buses from Thurso to Dalbiti and double-deckers crowding the city trams towards oblivion of grandiose department stores and miserable slums, tea rooms and single ends, savage sectarianism and gloomy gentility, no quarter football and stultifying Sundays. This was the land of few cars and no seat belts, no motorways, but a railway station in every town of any size and marshalling yards full of wagons laden with coal and iron and timber and grain, sleek black cattle and black-faced sheep, towns of 20,000 with three or four cinemas. The land of Tom Johnson's hydro board, building new dams at Loch Sloy, Loch Tummel and Glenafric. The land of old folk in Harris and Wester Ross and Sutherland, with no electricity yet and barely a word of English. The land of tatties and herring, of oatcakes and shortbread, of anthrax on Grignard and no hedgehogs in the Uists. 
This was the land of Shetland fishermen who despised the mackerel, of children in sky who grew bored of two plentiful scallops, and crumbling, condemned, crushed in Glasgow, desperate to disperse its people and breathe a new breath, raise the slums and raise new towns and peripheral estates. This was the land of black houses and prefabs and sandstone tenements and baronial villas named Woodstock and Ivanhoe and streets named Abbotsford Crescent and Kenilworth Road. The land of railway posters showing golfers and anglers and highland games. The land of working men out of Glasgow climbing the Arica Alps and women from Aberdeen hiking the Cairngorms from the Lynn of Dee, and thousands of thin, pale bodies cramming the beaches at Portobello and salt coats and largs. The land of paddle steamers bound for Tynebruich and Rothsey and Millport, weighed to the gunnels with trippers in July. The land of no swings on the Sabbath, no Polaris submarines in Holy Loch, no nuclear reactors at Dunray, no television, no cassette recorders, no photocopiers, no calculators, no PCs, no mobile phones, no microwave ovens, no supermarkets, no tights, no duvets, no drip dry shirts, no tracksuits or trainers. The land of semits and girdles and long aching cold Januarys and 30 foot snowdrifts on border farms that buried whole flocks and wet days in March when the air hung with coal dust from Clackmannan to Galston and Kelty to Fallin. The land of TB, of rickets and kinkhost, measles and buffets. The cartoon land of Desperate Dan and Black Bob, Corky the Cat and Keyhole Kate, Slod Snooty and Pansy Potter, Wuzzy Wiz, Plum Macduff and Biffo the Bear, the Brune and Urwally, Babru and Sandy. This was Scotland in 1950 when Rangers won the league and the Scottish Cup and East Fife won the League Cup and Scotland beat England at rugby but were beaten at football and the Edinburgh Festival was a three-year-old bairn just learning to talk in a foreign language. A land of rain like thin mist, smur, rain that would not stop, that got into your bones and into your head. This was Scotland in 1950. I'm kind of conscious that time is racing on. There are a couple of novels that I've not mentioned yet, one of them being The Professor of Truth, which is influenced heavily by the Lockerbie disaster, which is something that has obsessed me for a long time. Having written that book, which is a book with no laughs in it whatsoever, for obvious reasons, I decided I had to write a funny book to get my spirits up again. So I then wrote a book called To Be Continued, um, which is about a man going on a kind of highland road trip in the company of a speaking toad. So quite different, really. And uh, and it's funny that Hazel said that um, she's been trying to get me to come here for four years because um, it's true. And I she doesn't know this yet, but I kind of, about three weeks ago, I was thinking, oh, I wonder if I could phone up and put it off again. Um, because <laughs> cause I've, I've got a deadline to finish the next novel by the end of this month, in fact, next week, and, and I'm behind a wee bit, but I thought I wouldn't do that to you this time. So I've, 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 this, my deadline is, rather like Boris Johnson, my deadline is the 31st of October, but I've, I've, I've got an extension. <laughs> I've got an extension till the end of November, so I'm I'm okay. I'm not sure about him, but um, coming up with a new sto a new idea for a story every day was not always easy. But in January I, I, that of that year, I, I I wrote a story about Jack. This is the Jack of Jack and the Beanstalk, uh, and it was a kind of spoof story, and I enjoyed that one. So I wrote another one, and then I thought, ah, this is great. I've got a, I've got a, somebody I can keep coming back to. So I wrote two Jack stories every month of the year. So there are 24 Jack stories in this book. Jack went up the glen one afternoon and lay down by a dark pool where he knew the trout liked to lie. He put his hand in under the bank and waited. After a while he felt something come to rest in his upturned palm. He gently raised his hand and then pulled it out suddenly. A bonny brown trout flopped onto the grass. To Jack's great surprise, the trout spoke. Spare me, sir. Only put me back in the water and I will grant you a wish. You're on, says Jack, and I wish for anything at all. Aye, but hurry up about it, gasps the trout. I'll hear a poke of chips, says Jack, and he flips the trout into the water and a steaming portion of chips wrapped in newspaper appears in his hand. He's about to start eating when he remembers something else he should have asked for. 
Quickly he puts his hand under the bank and finds the trout lying at the bottom, recovering, and fetches her back out. I'll let you go if you give me another wish, he says. You're a hard man, but I have no choice, says the trout. What do you want? Salt and vinegar on the chips, says Jack, and pushes the trout into the water. In an instant, the chips are slithered in salt and vinegar. Och, says Jack, I forgot another thing. So he dips his hand into the burn and lands the trout a third time. What now, says the trout, I'm finding this very stressful. A nice bit of fish and batter, Jack says. That'll be just bra, thank you. Done, says the trout, and Jack lets her go. And a beautiful portion of fish and golden batter is beside the chips. Ten minutes later, Jack is wiping his mouth on the paper when he thinks, what an idiot. If I'd only thought I could have had a fish supper every day for the rest of my life. So he lay down by the burn again, but although he waited till it was dark, and he'd lost all sensation up to his shoulder. The trout never returned to his hand. A lot of the stories in this book bear the question, are they really stories or are they something else? And this one is kind of not really a story, but I'm going to read it anyway. And again, it's 365 words. I read this one out in, uh, at the Edinburgh Book Festival in, in 2013, and somebody said, oh, you stick that on YouTube. So I did, and it went a bit um, crazy. And so this is a, a thing called The News Where You Are, which is um, based on that really annoying thing that they do at the end of the news, you know, when they're about to switch from the London news to somewhere else, and they say, that's all from us, and now it's time for The News Where You Are. And I'm quite sure there was a committee that sat down to say, how are we going to do this? We don't want to say, now it's over to the provinces, or we can't say, now it's over to the, the other nations, because there'll be people in the north of England that say, well, what are you talking about? And so they, I'm sure this committee came up with this really anodyne phrase, um, The News Where You Are, and they said, brilliant, that covers it all, and it won't insult anybody. It insulted everybody. Anyway, this is my take on it. That's all from us, and now it's time for the news where you are. The news where you are comes after the news where we are. The news where we are is the news. It comes first. The news where you are is the news where you are. It comes after. We do not have the news where you are. The news where you are may be news to you, but it is not news to us. The news may be international, national, or regional. The news where we are may be international news. The news where you are is never international news. Where you are is not international. The news where you are comes after the international and national news. The news where you are may be national news or regional news. However, national news where you are is not national news where we are. It is the news where you are. If the news where you are is national news, it is only national where you are. The news where we are is national wherever you are. On Saturdays, there is no news where you are after the news where we are. In fact, there is no news where you are on Saturdays. Any news there is, is not where you are. It is where we are. If there is news where you are, but not where we are, it will wait until Sunday. After the news where you are comes the weather. The weather where you are is not the national weather. The weather where you are comes after the news where you are, and after the weather where you are comes the national weather. Do not confuse the national weather with the weather where you are. The weather where you are comes first, but is lesser weather than the national weather. <laughs> Extreme weather is news. However, weather that is more extreme where you are than where we are is not news. Weather that is extreme where we are is news, even if extreme weather where we are is only average weather where you are. <laughs> On average, weather where you are is more extreme than weather where we are. Tough shit. Good night. <laughs> Thank you for your indulgence. <laughs> Thank you, James, for an interesting evening. Um, you talk a little bit in some of your books about the supernatural. Do you think any of your work have come from the supernatural, or 
is all your work your own thought? Wow. <laughs> you mean, have, has there been some kind of <laughs> external force? <laughs> uh, I hope not. I don't think it's come from anywhere else, but what I what I think is, what's, what I find really fascinating about the whole process of writing is that um, when I'm in the groove, as it were, when I'm really writing, I, you, you stop and go back and look at it and you think, where did that all come from? So there's a sort of subconscious level at which stuff happens, um, but I think it's all internal. I think it, it, it's stuff that I have absorbed that then gets processed in some strange and sometimes quite miraculous way because I don't understand why and how it happens and then it comes back out again. I, I don't think many writers sit and something kind of just happens as a result of being sort of, yeah, um, not even divinely inspired but inspired by the muse if you want to put it that way. I think that's rare. And even then, I suspect that it doesn't really happen like that, that actually there's been stuff going on um, that has taken a while to, to come to fruition. Because what I do know about writing is that an awful lot of it is just graft. And that you, certainly I, and most of the writers that I know that I talk to, they go over, we go over and over stuff. We get loads of things wrong. You know, I, I write, I write, for a day and then I read it the next day and I think, God, that's awful, it's terrible, there's nothing in there, ditch half of it, go back over it, maybe save a tiny percentage of it and then you move on from there. So it's, it's, it can be a very, very um, long process with a lot of errors and a lot of false starts and a lot of just simply working the way, trying to get it right. Um, and then sometimes, you get into a place where it just flows. Um, but I do fundamentally think it all comes from processes going on inside one's head. When you decide to write, you obviously, when you were doing Joseph Knight, you've got to do a lot of research into that. So does research take a big part of your writing? Yeah, it does. Um, it certainly, it used to take a great deal more than it does now because even as recently as five, say ten years ago, five years ago, I had to do nearly all the research in the library. Um, you know, so when I was doing the research for Joseph Knight, I spent, and also with the fanatic as well, I spent hours, weeks and weeks and weeks in libraries looking at rare documents and, and digging books out of the recesses of things. But now, so much of that information is available online, and that is a blessing in some respects, but I'm a, bit, I'm a bit nervous about it because I think that it's very easy then to miss things which aren't on the internet. And um, so although I don't go to the library nearly as much as I used to, I still do go when I'm going, I need to double check that or triple check it or whatever. Um, but it's it's absolutely true. I mean, even when I was writing Under Lonely Still, which is now, to, I was writing it, 10, 11 years ago, the um, one of the things that had happened around about that time was that the old Path A newsreels had all been put online. So you can access all those things that used to go and, you know, when, when you went to the pictures and between the first film and the second film, you got these little newsreels. Um, they're all online now. And that is just the most amazing archive to do. And, and, and I was able to look at a lot of the things I was writing about in Anne the Landley Still and actually go and look at films. There's a scene in there of um, Harry Lauder's funeral, for example. That's all on film and it's online. I, I mean, that is such a goldmine for any novelist. And it simply wasn't available to people, you know, uh, until the last 15 years or less. Um, but yeah, you're right. I do have to do quite a lot of research. Um, it's easier... <laughs> It's both easier and difficult. If, you, if I'm researching a novel like Joseph Knight, which is entirely set in the 18th century, obviously you want to try and get it right. But at least you know there's not going to be anybody popping up in an audience and saying, but I was there, it wasn't you like that. <laughs> but as when you write contemporary stuff, folk do pop up and say, but that's not how it was and kill winning or whatever, you know. <laughs> you know. So it's a, it's a funny mix. Hello, James. I 
um, you haven't mentioned this so far, but I was quite interested in how you came to be able to write such good Scots. Mm, um, don't know, because it wasn't my uh, my childhood language. That's what I was wondering. Confession time. I was born in the in Kent, and uh, and um, so my parents. Um, my grand, three of my grandparents were Scottish, and they'd all moved south in the 1920s. Um, but I was born in Kent, and my dad got a job that brought us to Scotland when I was six years old. Um, but it was an English-speaking household, and it was a very middle-class household as well. So um, although we didn't speak Scots, but every time I stepped out of the house and walked around in Stirling, and you know, which is I grew up in that neck of the woods, and you went on the bus or you went to the post office or whatever and it was everywhere and I was intrigued by this um, and I also realised that it was quite useful to learn to speak like that to stop myself getting beaten up all the time you know it was, it was a sort of it was a sort of defence mechanism so um, it was a it was yeah it was um, I just was fascinated by it and what really fascinated me was that um, it was so different from the way that my parents spoke and the, w the way that I spoke, and yet it was a full-on language, clearly, from the way everybody was communicating in it. But what I hadn't a notion of was that it could also be a written language and it could also be a language of, of great literary uh, value and 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 worth. Um, you know, we obviously we, we knew Burns's poems and songs and so on, but that was mostly oral. And you'd, I never, I don't remember looking at much of Burns's poetry <coughs> on the page. Um, and it wasn't until really until I told McDermott that I, who wrote a very very heightened literary kind of Scots, it wasn't until that I started reading his poems that I thought. Um, this is the same language, but he's doing something totally different with it. And it seemed to me that he was connecting high art and high culture with the language that I had been hearing on the street and on the bus for all of my life. And that was why I said, when I started reading McDermott, it was like a total revolution in my thinking about language and literature and so on. So, And also, because nobody in my entire education had told me anything about this stuff, it, McDermott opened a, a door to the the literature of the previous 700 years in Scots, of which there is a vast amount and of which the vast bulk of our population knows absolutely nothing. And that to me is both shocking, but also it's exhilarating because there's so much out there to discover. But I also find that really um, quite um, depressing. So yeah, so that was really why, why I'm so interested in Scots. Yeah. You've just talked about um, people not knowing the history of Scots. Mm. Um, I absolutely love Joseph Knight. And when I was at school, we weren't taught Scottish history. And I'm really interested in that you, um, with your background as an academic in Scottish history, and you came across it uh, with surprise. And um, I was just, I thought it was such an amazing story and it tied into the era. And um, I'm so sad that uh, we haven't been taught that sort of thing in schools. No. And um, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, as I said, I didn't, my first degree was not in Scottish history. In fact, I remember when I first went to Edinburgh University to do an undergraduate degree in history, um, I remember there was somebody else there who was in this, who, who was contemporary of mine who had, was in the Scottish history department, which was a kind of ghetto over there. And the main history department was over here. And people in the main history department were unbelievably snooty about Scottish history. They, they used to sort of say, oh, why, why don't you do, come over and join us and do real history? It was, it was as bad as that. So Scottish history really did not figure very highly in the school curriculum and it wasn't considered to be real history in certainly at Edinburgh University but not just there. Um, so, But when I went back and did my PhD it was it was uh, Scottish history that I was interested in by that stage. Um, but you're right, it was astonishing that this 
whole chapter of our history had been lost or perhaps buried. Um, um, and there was all kinds of reasons, complicated reasons, why that might be the case. It's changing now, um, and there is now a huge amount of work has been done uh, to find out more about the Scottish history that we might have missed, which I talk about in this pamphlet a wee bit. Um, but what worries me about is that history as a school subject is becoming, I think, less and less um, popular. And it's still taught at school level, I think, in a very piecemeal way. Um, just the nature of the way that history is, is has been taught for a long time, I think that a lot of children, if they do learn any history, they come away with a very weird sense of chronology because they dot about from one place to another. Uh, you know, they do something out the First World War and then they do something from the Industrial Revolution and then they maybe do something about um, Scarabray and Orkney or whatever and then they do something. And, and it's so disjointed and I feel that, that it's not surprising in a way that, that a lot of people have a very um, bitty understanding uh, uh, of of not just Scottish history but history generally, and don't actually connect the, the dots up very well in their heads. And people like Tom Devine and others have done great written books, single volume books that actually do help to make that stuff make sense. But I, I still think we're not very good at learning history and teaching it to our younger people. I was at school in the 1930s, and I learned about Scottish history then. I know it's modern day history now, but it must be the education society in Scotland that don't want to bring it in. I, I think what you've said is really fascinating because a few years ago I would have said, oh, it's never been taught, but it's absolutely not the case. And I know from speaking to you and lots of other people that that Scottish history and Scottish literature was actually in the school curriculum right through until I think the um, late, mid to late 60s and into the 70s. And things began to change then. Uh, I don't, I'm not an educational expert, um, so I can't quote chapter and verse on this, but I think there was a shift, and I'm not sure what that was about, um, but I think, th well, one of the things that happened was, was that um, there was a lot of Scottish educational publishing that had gone on. There were some wonderful publishers like uh, Oliver, Oliver and Boyd in Edinburgh and Blackies in Glasgow and there were others who, who made books that actually fitted the Scottish curriculum. But those publishing houses all got absorbed into houses in London. So for example, Oliver and Boyd, for example, was bought by a company called Longman's. And gradually they reduced the, um, the books that were being pr produced specifically for the Scottish schools um, uh, curriculums and eventually those firms were all closed down. So I think there's a number of things that are going on there but, but it's a sort of chicken and egg thing. Once you can't get the books to teach it then you don't teach it and then, then no, nobody knows how to teach it because they haven't been taught it themselves and so it's a self-perpetuating thing. So I think although things have begun to change for the better now it's going to take a long time to reverse that that loss. But it's really fascinating to hear somebody uh, like yourself s remind us that actually it's not the case that the Scottish history wasn't ever taught. And, and I think it's really important to remember that. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm just thinking, uh, is, is history a wee bit like the news? The, the history where we are is more important than the history where you are? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, 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 there is that element as well, of course. Um, um, and again, I'm generalising and I'm sure that, that there'll be plenty of examples of, of what I'm about to say that is not the case. But I think there was certainly, for a period of time in the, in the 60s and 70s and perhaps even beyond that, there was a sense that Scottish history really wasn't very important, um, that it didn't matter, that the main the main story took place somewhere else, and therefore it wasn't there wasn't any point in studying it. I mean, for example, there was a, there's been a long-held uh, view that the old Scottish Parliament, the one that 
ended in 1707 was a disastrous organization that couldn't do anything, couldn't control the king and all that sort of stuff. But actually, there's been some studies recently that demonstrate that it actually was rather good and clever at um, controlling regal power in a way that was quite different from how the parliament in England was operating, where actually in some respects the, the power of the monarch was far greater um, and the parliament, until it came to a kind of crunch in the 1640s with the English Civil War, hadn't actually been that good at controlling um, regal power, whereas in Scotland it had been much more um, subtle, if you like. So, you know, in a sense, it depends upon how you look at the history that tells you whether it's important and which bits are important or not. Um, and that inevitably makes is a political. You know, there are political decisions in amongst that as well. Um, um, I don't suppose it would surprise anybody to know that I am in favour of Scottish independence. But, but, but it's really fascinating that um, that these issues very often come down to political points of view. Um, and, and actually, the language thing is, is similar as well. You know, uh, 1872, uh, the Education Act comes into force and it is written into the Education Act that all children in Scotland will be educated in English. And you, uh, so no Gaelic in the classroom and certainly no Scots. Now you can argue that at the time that the people would have said, well, Scots is just a dialect of English and so on, and I'm not going to get into that discussion. But nevertheless, as again, as many folk will know, you were physically punished for using certain words in the classroom often and Gaelic certainly, there's lots of examples of it, of um, a teacher and a, and, a, and, a, and a pupil chatting away to each other in Gaelic in the playground, but as soon as they went into the classroom, they conducted everything in English. Now, those decisions, it seems to me, are based upon a whole range of, of, of things. But there's a political element there, there's a cultural element in there, there's an element about linguistic hierarchies and so on. And you know these are still things that play out today so it's a it's a it's complicated it's a complicated story but there's no question in my mind that a lot of these things um uh, come down to politics james um this afternoon you were working with children aged from nursery 3 year olds right up to secondary 2 14 year olds and there was something about the activity you started off with with the younger ones where there was a series of exercises in English um, touch your nose, touch your head etc that was then repeated in Scots and before the children even were taking time to look at one another they were actually doing what you were asking them to do with the Scots instruction. And there is a huge element of knowing Scots, and as you say, not necessarily regarding it as a written language, although the Parliament had Scots as its language. You're doing something that's very rarely done because you're bridging the adult world of literature and the children's world of literature. C can you talk to us just a little bit more about the power of Scots and, and the fact that it's transcending uh, and that, that you yourself are doing that rare thing of meeting the two worlds of literature? Basically, these books and about another 60 something, 70 books we've published now, published by this little publishing house called Itchy Koo, which uh, I am set up um, with a, a, an Edinburgh publisher and with a, another writer called Matthew Fitt, who's a good friend of mine. Um, and Matthew and I, we both we were both going into schools and talking about the 1990s now. And we were both interested, he's, he's a Scots speaker from Dundee, and, and we both had, had the same view, was that... Um, Consistently, the Scots language was excluded from children's education um, nearly entirely, except perhaps in the run-up to Burns Night when they all got to learn a, a, 
a, a poem or a song, and then the rest of the year it was not allowed in the classroom, or it just was not thought about in the classroom. And we thought this was weird and wrong, and that, that actually it was disadvantaging a lot of children who were coming to school from Scots-speaking backgrounds, and then the first thing that happened to them was that they were told that they didn't live in a house, they lived in a house, they didn't live at home, they lived at home, and all the words that they had spent the five years of their life up to that point using were devalued or at least sold, well, that's not how we do things here. And I'm the first person to say that everybody in the modern world in this country should, as far as they possibly can, be given all the tools to work with English as well as they can, because English is a very, very important language. But I don't believe that should be the expense of the language they bring to school. And I think, and I don't think that these two things are mutually exclusive. If we were serious about valuing Scots as a language and as a means of communication and as an expression of something quite profound within people, because language is one of the most powerful bits of your identity that you can have, it seems to me that the education system could and should actually be structured in a different way so that um, the, the, the Scots and English are valued equally, even if they're not used in the same way uh, all the time. I, I, you know, I'm not a kind of ideological nutcase who thinks that somehow we should all stop speaking English and all start speaking Scots or Gaelic or whatever. I just don't believe that's a realistic way in the world. However, I look at other countries in the world, most countries in Europe and many countries in other parts of the world all deal with multilingual societies. There are very few countries in the world which are monoglottal. And uh, and they all have, some some are really bad at it, some repress um, other languages than, the, than the, the official language, but many others don't. In Malaysia, they have three, they have English, um, um, Chinese and um, Malay, I think I'm right in saying. I'm not sure if I've got the right term for that last. And, and then there's another one as well. And they are doing their best to try, actually try to say these are all valid in different ways, but we don't use them in the same way at the same time. Uh, you know, so people need to know how to use Chinese. They need to know how to use English. But we also don't wish to, um, to basically say you're a third class citizen because you have this other language. And if you go to Denmark or Norway or, uh, um, or um, well, Spain's an interesting country for all kinds of reasons because it's got several different languages going on within the the, 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 the sort of greater land mass of Spain. Um, they all have different ways of doing it, but very, very few of these countries just simply repress one language uh, or several languages and, and put one up as the sort of dominant language. And uh, it seems odd to me that the British Isles as a whole has got into this idea that we're an English-speaking, an entirely English-speaking culture, whereas in fact, um, the, a, there's a lot of people in Wales that speak Welsh, there's people in Scotland who speak Gaelic, there's people, there were people in other parts of England who spoke Cornish and Manx, and we've got a lot of people in Scotland who speak to some level or other, speak Scots. In fact, if the census of 2011, the first time that anybody bothered to ask a question about Scots, if the census, census of 2011 is anywhere near accurate, um, then you've got between 1.6 and 1.9 million people who ticked the boxes that said, I can read, write, speak, or understand Scots. And that, if true, and I accept that there's, there's a weird thing going on there because of the closeness of Scots to English and the fact that they're overlapping languages, but if those figures are true, then that makes Scots the second largest spe um, language group in the UK bigger than any other language group. And, and, any other, and that also means that it's the language, a language spoken or understood by something like 35% of the Scottish population. Any other country in Europe would be doing something serious about that as an issue. So, um, so to go back to NQQ, we thought back in the 1990s that we should do something to try to get Scots treated more seriously within the education system, and we thought the best way to do that was to start producing books in Scots. We thought that there was a demand and interest out there, 
and we'd been proved correct because this book, for example, has sold, I think, I'm right in saying 50,000 copies. Um, most, uh, Matthew did a wonderful translation of the Roald Dahl book, the, the Twits, which he translated as the Egypts. That sold, I think, 60,000 copies. He did, ha he did a, 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 a version of Harry Potter, the first Harry Potter that came out a year and a half ago. That sold nearly 40,000 copies. I mean, I'm not, say, I'm not saying the, the numbers, but we've also produced, a whole, not just translations, we've produced original books in Scots that have all, also sold in the tens of thousands. And not only that, but they're used in almost every primary school in the land now, to some extent or other. And that's created quite a change in primary school attitudes to language. Secondary schools have got some way to go, but that's not their fault. They've got such a packed curriculum, it's really difficult for them to find a space for this. But what, what we really wanted to do was to produce a range of books that children would get access to at different stages of their education, and that therefore later on in their lives they might go, you know what, I can pick up a book of poems by McDermott or by Robert Burns, or I can pick up a book of stories or you know a, a novel by James Robertson and when I read it I, I'm not going to be totally flummoxed when I come across a, a word that I've never come across before because actually I've come across it in the past. Um, sorry that's a very long answer to, but it's a very complicated question. Yeah it, it is a complicated question but uh, as you say it's, it's not just the numbers it's it's the interest of the children and their parents as well in, in reading this literature. There is a real um, there's something real that is not about a market. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's, it's about it's a way of life. It's contradictory as well, though, of course, because some, for perfectly reasonable, understand, perfectly understandable reasons, um, a lot of parents don't want their children to um, speak uh, in a certain way. And very often, one of the first things that we have to do is when we ask parents what the, what the languages that they're using they say oh we speak we speak bad English or we speak slang and so there's a sort of educational process there but some of the some some parents some parents who are absolutely wonderful Scots speakers themselves get really upset about their parents using these books in school <laughs> not all of them some of them love it but some come in Matthew Matthew tells a great story of him doing a session with a, 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 a class and the next day Long after he'd gone, a father came in and slammed the book down on the table and says to the teacher, there's no way that my bairn's going to speak like that. <laughs> so it's full of contradictions and difficulties. And again, because generations of people have been told you'll not get on well if you speak like that. So it's complicated. And I, you know, I, I really don't think there's any point in, you know, I, 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 for me, it's about trying to, to tease that stuff out and say, look, it doesn't have to be like that. It's not just an either all thing. We can actually um, have, uh, have both and recognize the value of Scots because you're, you know, you're absolutely right. A, a, I don't believe that you can fully understand Scotland's culture if you don't have some understanding of the Scots language because it's everywhere. Um, and B, I think that if you don't um, recognize it, you're actually devaluing half of the population because the, 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 they, are, they are then seen to be, you know, not speaking properly. They're not, you know, they're seen to be um, using language that is not acceptable in certain con you know, conditions or certain um, places. Um, there was a thing in the Times newspaper I read very briefly today, and it, again, this doesn't just apply to Scotland. Um, People going for job interviews, and uh, and they'd done some research to suggest that the folk who are doing the interviews, they make up their minds within the first seven or eight words that the that the interviewee speaks, and they make up their minds about that person on the basis of how they speak. So if they don't speak pro proper, they've got far less chance of getting the job even within that space of time, and even regardless of their qualifications. Now, I think I'm always a bit sceptical about some of these, these um, you know, academic researchers that get in the newspapers. Nevertheless, I think there's an interesting story there, um, and that applies 
you know, it applies across England as well. And in, in, you know, when they do these things about which la which which uh, accent do people trust, and people have very low um, 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 expectations or very low um, valuation of, say, Birmingham language, uh, Bir Birmingham accent or a Liverpool accent. Scottish accents actually come out quite well uh, in that, but that's what you might call educated Scottish accents. So it's a, it's a complicated issue. Proofreading in our household, for obvious reasons, is a, 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 a tetchy sort of point. Uh, we're quite obsessive about it. Um, are you absolutely certain that the 365 stories, which each have 365 words, is that an accurate assessment? Is there not one there that's got 364? <laughs> and would your editor demand a rewrite of the whole, <laughs> the whole story? I, um, no, I, I actually don't think, I think there really are none. I, I know that because the copy editor and I went through it quite carefully because when we, were, when we were actually thinking about this, we were going, what about hyphenated words? Do they count as one or two? And so we had to make a decision about those. And that made a difference. And then, of course, we argued about whether certain things should or shouldn't be hyphenated. Um, so it got quite um, finicky. Um, but um, I have actually, I do occasionally just check on my computer by the, 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 the word count is correct. And I haven't come across one yet that isn't. So unless you've found one. <laughs> Splendid. Thank you.